Okay, I hope you're ready to come here, ready and for some edge computing stuff that we're going to talk about. Edge computing is hot. What this session is to talk about the business value of edge computing. What it is not is to what is edge computing. We're not going to talk about that. If you want to go more in depth, there's a lot of uh, Linux Foundation stuff that you can download. My name is Larry Carvalho. I'm an independent analyst at Robust Cloud. And with me, I have you know, three panelists. I would like them to introduce themselves, starting with Marilyn. I get to go first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Marilyn Basanta. Um, I work at VMware and run all the product management for our edge computing platform. Stu? Hi, I'm Stu Miniman. I've been coming to the KubeCon since uh, the early days and back at the OpenStack shows before when we were starting to talk about containers. Uh, I joined Red Hat two years ago. I'm director of Market Insights, a part of the OpenShift team. Um, before that, I'd spent a decade as an analyst and host of the Cube. Manib? Hey, my name is Manib Nazadeen. Uh, I'm the chief marketing officer for networking and edge business at Intel. Um, I've just been there 45 days. Before that, I was at uh, VMware uh, building the edge computing platform uh, as the general manager. Okay, so <clears throat> what, what we put together over here for you is to talk about different use cases of edge. I mean, edge is running all over the place when you think about agriculture, when you think about uh, mining, you think about healthcare. We've got a lot of uh, edge solutions. What is the business value that you can drive maybe in manufacturing? Can you, you know, improve maintenance, you know, throughput, uh, improve quality? Those are the things that we need to think about when we, when we bring up edge. So with that, what I'm going to start for the for first is with Muneeb to talk about one of his use cases, spend some time on that. Then we'll have the rest of the other two panelists talk about their use cases. And then we will go to you know, more of a discussion Q&A uh, you know, within the panelists and outside the panelists about that, okay? So with that, Muneeb, I'll bring up your slide and if you can. Yeah, um, I think uh, we decided to kind of showcase what we did for um, you know, smart cities and you know, build out a roadside unit. I know we said we won't talk about what a definition, definition of edge is, but you know, edge is an interesting phenomenon that well, has been there here for a long time. But um, what we see is you know, workloads being built at the edge more, more often now than in the past. So, um, and like Larry just said, they manifest themselves in different verticals because they saw it being particular problems. So I think all of us have a, a vertical use case scenario that's happening. In this instance, um, and you know, there's a lot of convergence of technology happening there too. In this instance, we've converged uh, 5G connectivity to uh, AI, uh, you know, inferencing at the edge because we feel inferencing at the edge is a major driver. A lot of new gen data being generated. How do you infer that? A lot of that is trigger-based. <laughs> there's a lot of data coming at you. Storing that data is not a lot of value, but you know, inferencing what outcome you want to come out of it is what the value is in. So how do you actually do inferencing? So what we built here with Capgemini as a partner, and we're testing this in um, uh, cities of London and, and Turin in Italy, and uh, they are roadside units which are connected through 5G, and they're spread around uh, the cities, and they are doing centralized traffic management uh, on you know, multimodal transport. So you know, your road, your railways, your port, uh, all of that together and coordinated. So there is a level of a control plane which manages a central city, uh, um, think of it as uh, city level operations. And then there is individual edge uh, units and each unit has 5G connectivity, it has a, a small edge compute platform, it has uh, you know, vision, computer vision all built into it. So we're doing um, inferencing of those applications, and I'll follow up with you know in, in in further kind of questions you know certain scenarios, but you know traffic management is a start. Um, we're also doing traffic management for you know we're, we're testing with emergency services, so I think that's the important part. So this is ambulance, fire, um, you know police, I, you know those are kind of the the high stressed uh, situations, and uh, the application level compute that's happening is just inferencing, looking at traffic patterns, looking at, you know, incidents, looking at all of that and centralizing it. And, uh, you know, we've used, uh, you know, our 5G s software stack as well as our, you know, AI inferencing stack and run it on a really thin edge uh, kind of platform which is built out. So um, 
amazing kind of take. We have multiple cities around the world uh, willing to kind of jump on this. So. Yep. So as you can see on this slide, you have, you have all of these open source products that have been used. You see what Intel products are used. And what I find fascinating about traffic management is all the edge devices that you need uh, everywhere from, from, the, from the roads to, you know, to the utilities when you have it, you know, traffic signals, et cetera, that all have to work in cohesion with each other. So with that, we'll go to our, you know, next with Stu, um, you know, who's going to talk about uh, what edge computing is in defense and security. Yeah, th thanks, Larry. So, uh, yeah, the, the use case we're talking about here, this is actually the, the central IT department uh, for the Israeli Defense Fund, a uh, group called Mamram. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, I, I, I think back, Manib, the, the first conference I went to that was like really talking a lot uh, about containers was, you know, back, uh, you know, IDF, the, you know, which we used to joke, it's the Israeli Defense Fund, or is it the, you know, Intel Developer Forum? My, my daughter had a backpack uh, from, from that one, and people would get confused. Um, so, um, but uh, the, the Israeli Defense Fund, when we talked about containers in like the earliest days, and it just reminder some of the basic things, what can I do? I can spin things up faster. I can, I can just accelerate uh, my applications uh, because uh, the, the unit of IT is much closer to that application. And so as it shows here on the slide, you know, things that used to, you know, oh, we used to do our build and we used to do it with VMs and it took us weeks. And, you know, now we can take that down to hours. Um, and the other thing, you know, I think a common theme you're going to hear from all of us AI, ML are great workloads here because, again, if it's I need to be able to, do I do my processing back at some central IT in the cloud or can I do something at the edge? So um, I, I heard a great line recently that at the edge, what we really need to become really efficient is killing the data at that location because um, we, we all know how there's that explosion of data at the edge, but I don't really need all of that. So um, in, in this case, there's many times they want to be able to process it there. Uh, you know, we've got Kubernetes running up on the International Space Station. And obviously, if I had to think about every time I process something, you know, sending it back down to the Earth, that, that could be a challenge in a lot of cases. So again, some, some really interesting things. Uh, one of the open source projects uh, that we, we list on here, it's uh, Kubeflow is uh, the basis for the, uh, the open data hub. So a whole lot of uh, data science tooling that's available uh, that this customers and many others are being able to uh, take advantage of. So yeah, I, I think just accelerating, helping their developers. We, we did a lot of training for them to get more people up and running because there's that dichotomy. There's new skill sets that we need to learn Learn, but at the edge, typically, you don't have the, the people resources. So that's why we have to have a lot more automation. We, we, we want to be able to, you know, it's not taking people out, but it's having people in the right location to be able to take care of what we need. And, and typically, at the edge, you're not going to have that highly trained skill set to be able to take care of it. And, and the last point on this, of course, the you know, general message you'll hear from Red Hat, it's consistency everywhere. So Linux lives everywhere. OpenShift can live everywhere that Linux can. So um, this environment was based on uh, what's known as single node OpenShift. So if, if you know just a Kubernetes architecture, normally I, I need you know how many compute nodes and worker nodes and how many systems that is. Well, single node OpenShift allowed us to boil that down to a, a single machine with both the control plane and the worker nodes, which helps, of course, if it needs to be disconnected. So this can work in you know semi-connected or disconnected environments for a time, and when things get reconnected, they can. They they can, you know, share the data that they need. So I think we'll have some more questions to dig into it later, but, you know, that, that, that's the overall. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Stu. So one of the things you're seeing over here is the whole MLAI aspect of Edge. What, what I have seen as Edge has been progressing are, are three different areas that there is some innovation that is helping Edge. There are a lot more, but the three that I see, obviously, is MLAI on the Edge, where you can use it for image recognition and several other uh, aspects of uh, you know what what can be done on the edge. Uh, the second part of it is 5G and networking. You know the speed that you need to you know connect with these devices, and obviously all the security that that goes on with it. And the third area is more hardware acceleration at the edge, where you have specialized chips or made-for-purpose chips that are built for the edge. And I think these three aspects of technology evolution is really improving the um, evolution you know, off edge in the market. And in this case, you're seeing one of them, but obviously behind the scenes is using the other three aspects, uh, other two aspects of edge. Um, <clears throat> so with that, again, you see the um, 
open source products, what, what uh, Red Hat products are being used in this solution. And with that, we'll go to, to Marilyn to talk about the VMware story about the global food provider. Yeah, hi everyone. So um, similar stories. So we, we got smart cities, we got um, defense, and so I'll talk a little bit about manufacturing or processing, food processing. So um, this is a customer, it's a food processing customer in the US, and they've got multiple different processing plants. And so what, what they've been able to do for each um, different processing line, they've deployed um, our edge compute offering, and they're doing, they've got um, cameras all over the line, and they're basically doing inferencing at the edge as well. It's interesting, I didn't think we were all gonna talk about inferencing, but uh, we, uh, they're doing inferencing on the line, meaning that they've got the different workers physically taking the meat off of the bone, and what they're doing is they're using the cameras and the inferencing technology. So after the worker has done their job and put the, say separated the meat from the bone, they put the bone back on the line. And then the inferencing is actually analyzing that in real time. And then as that bone comes down the line, if they realize that maybe the worker didn't get all the meat off the bone or there's something wrong with it, they can kick it back onto the line to come back to be processed again. And so it kind of does a few different things. One is it, it becomes more business efficient for the company. And then second, they, they become more sustainable sustainable um, as we know how how impactful it is for you know to grow a cow and to, to grow animals for our food processing it's very important for us to be able to be more sustainable um, the nice thing a few advantages here is that this particular use case for them has actually completely paid for itself for them to enable then other use cases. They can do then do predictive maintenance because they've got, um, they can connect the sensors onto our platform. They can also then do um, more, well, I mean, what they're doing also is closed loop automation to be able to change the different um, arms to kick that bone back onto the line. Um, and um, they can also then do training with the workers because they're monitoring as the workers are working. They've got it for safety if something were to happen with the workers as they're doing their job. So it's just, it. It's having that edge computing platform at each of these processing lines besides the economic advantages and opens them up to be able to do all the other different use cases of connecting so many different discrete systems together. Um, I think the super interesting part about manufacturing as well is that manufacturing is um, bringing together, there's still a lot of use cases happening physically. So when usually other businesses and previously have done inferencing at the edge, they'll do that on the physical box with the cameras. It's a completely separate system from anything else they have running on the factory. So that's all the hardware sprawl that they have. So with our edge compute platform, we can really bring that together and make it more efficient to run their existing workloads in a lot of cases are still VMs as well as help them modernize. And I'll also say with a lot of these existing workloads, they can completely cut out um, the VM stage and get directly to Kubernetes, which is another great part of it. So it's just interesting all of the different use cases to come together to, to solve for this, um, for solve for all of the different use cases in manufacturing. Great, thank you. So I'm going to follow up with, with, first of all, here you see another example of, uh, you know, both image recognition as well as AI ML, which are connected with each other. This is also related to the amount of data that is processed now at the end and how much of data growth is at the edge versus the cloud. And, and that's, that's expected to be in many more, you know, multiple X times of what is on the cloud is, would be on the edge in the future as by 2025. There are several numbers being run out there and I would like some of the panelists to talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Marilyn, if we think about this use case that you brought up, how much of waste did the company you know, reduce? And one of the things why companies get into these kinds of things is, is the recognition uh, by their customers. You know, fo folks are looking at ESG, they want to see, you know, how sustainable you are. So did this company get any recognition from, from the, um, generally their consumers as, as to how they were doing it? And, you know, what, what would you talk about these two aspects of the solution? Yeah, I can say they definitely, of course, can, can market um, that as an advantage to them. I don't think they've yet received any public recognition, but I mean, the overall for them, is, it's, an, it's an important, like I said, statement to make. Um, and I do think is, it's becoming much more critical around the world, especially with everything that's going on. And so it's um, it's been a good thing for them. What I wanted to say for them as well is they've, you know, I think you wanted to know maybe particularly um, how much savings this is or what did you ask? Waste, less waste, the, how much less waste. waste is, sorry, yeah. thank you, it triggered my memory. Um, yeah, they've definitely been able to see significant um, reductions. I can't share the exact numbers, but it's you know double digit reduction as well as um, you know, for the cost savings, you know, I can't share the exact number, but this definitely has been um, a properly efficient use case that pays for itself. Got it, got it. 
So first two, you know, talking about the Israeli Defense Force, you know, what, what do you see over there? You know, what, what were the new MLAI processes that they did? What, what did value did they get, you know, without obviously giving up any state secrets over there? Yeah, uh, <laughs> one of those I could tell you, but uh, somebody would probably kill us all. Um, but no, um, seriously, it's, 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 yeah, it, it's really important. It's interesting. We, we often talk about the dynamics. Oh, it's, is it the cloud or is it the edge? Um, this unit, they actually call their edge thing, they're called cloudlets. Um, and that if you really think about just architecturally, um, it's all connected. So, you know, the, the typical um, model that we see is AI often, I do my training in the cloud um, and I do my processing at the edge. So, you know, we've worked with a lot of the auto manufacturers. It's like, well, you know, if you bought a Tesla or some other car there, um, it's not going to create the model in your car, but you want the latest software pushed to you um, and you need that processed immediately so that you know, you're, you're not going back to a central location. So it, it, it's the same thing uh, in, in this force is it has autonomy, but it is still tied into in feeding information back uh, to, to, to central IT. And that's really just a central tenet of, you know, constantly relearning and uh, iterating on what they're doing uh, from the field. Great. One, one question I want to ask all three of you, I heard this from Munib for the first time a couple of weeks ago, was edge native. And everybody is now talking, I cover cloud native, and I first time heard, okay, edge native. Tell me about edge native, what are companies doing to go to edge native, and what are each, you know, different types of examples of what you think they are going to get as business value of now putting edge native as one of their priorities. So I'll just start with Munib and go this way. Sure. Um, thank you for attributing that name to it. Uh, um, the reason I called it out, and I think it's, everybody is familiar with what it is, First, um, the application attributes are different. Like what you have to design for. Like we're all, maybe for 30 years, very good at streamlining IT. And we had a IT workload and IT workflow, well-defined in our mind. You know, from virtual machines to Kubernetes to containers. Like they were like, oh, with virtual machines is a create blueprints. Oh, I know how to put together an e-commerce app. There's a web tier, there's a database tier, there's an app tier. It's a blueprint, I push it out. When it comes to Kubernetes, I have a set of microservices, I can orchestrate them. As an industry, we've streamlined these IT workload and IT workflows. We're all working to make them more agile and efficient and learning. What we're discovering at the edge are OT workloads and OT workflows. You found each one of us talk about, you know, meat processing, me talk about, you know, transport units and, you know, road units and defense. The workflows are very different. Therefore, the workloads are also very different. Uh, the workflows are, you know, is there more, you know, meat on the bone? Um, for me, it's like, hey, how do you do traffic manage? So the workflows we need to adapt to. So if you actually peel this back and look at the application model, your compute network storage requirements, um, you know, power efficiency. You don't care about optimizing your application for power efficiency in a data center or a cloud because you assume there is unlimited power there. Whereas at the edge, you can't take that assumption. You're in an oil rig, you're in, so your power consumption needs to be super low. So the type of attributes you have to take into consideration to write an application completely change as you try to write this for the edge. Uh, that's the reason to call out that, hey, don't just try to take a, you know, a data center or a cloud-like technology and apply it. You'll have to refactor it, re, you know, retool it to consider these new attributes. And in, in, to find a better way, I call it edge native because I have a list of 14 attributes if you guys want to follow up, which by the way, I built at you know, VMware because I've been looking at this for two years and now at Intel, but um, those 14 attributes are, come from me engaging with about 100 plus you know, companies globally and trying to write these edge native applications and discovering that what we've done for 20, 30 years is not going to cut it uh, because the parameters that we have to zoom and write to are completely different. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Marilyn, about edge native. I know you have talked about it yesterday in your edge session. <laughs> yeah, I had my session with Ed in the audience here, and I'll actually can touch upon a little bit about the data aspects um, about edge native. So Muneep, of course, covered um, well here the, all the attributes that, of course, um, he built <laughs> for for us. But um, 
So I think it's one of the interesting stories is that everyone's telling the stories. When I look at the marketing across all of our different companies here at the edge, we all want to, we all want to tell the same story that you can have your applications anywhere, um, any, you know, anytime, anywhere, right? You can place them wherever you'd like. But the, the logistics of it, I think, is what we're really talking about is having a consistent operational model and management model across you know, your data center, your public cloud, your edge. But in terms of actually deploying the applications, you want to, of course, build them in similar ways, but you have to take into account the different attributes of what it means to be edge native. And then, of course, so um, something I just, I mean, I know we're talking about edge native, but how we handle data at the edge just needs to be handled differently. Like Stu said, some of it, you want to just kill the data at the edge. But in the cases of these AIML models, like once you process the inferencing, you might get additional new bits of data that the model maybe didn't process. So we have to find efficient ways to do sending that training, um, those training bits back to wherever the central model is, which typically will still be in the data center or the public cloud. But then also to do the real-time decision making, you need a stream or a messaging queue to put it on to be able to then process and give access to, to the other applications that are running at the edge to really tell the complete story. So you have to take into account not only the, um, you know, the refactoring, but how you handle the data at the edge to, like we said, the networking at the edge is just, it's a whole new model of, of how this all kind of comes together. And I'm really excited that, you know, over the past year or two, that edge native now really is like a proper term of how to describe applications at the edge. Stu, you want to add anything? Yeah, so, so to, I, I actually not heard the term edge native uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, before, but um, you know, when, when I think about you know, the general trend, what have we been solving for the last couple of decades? We're really talking about distributed systems. So um, the, the edge has certain challenges. I talked, you know, what's your network connectivity, Moody, you know, power and everything like that. From a software standpoint though, you know, there were certain things that Kubernetes made decisions when we built things that if you talk about the edge, it's like, well, Kubernetes is a little big and it's built for a lot of environments. So, you know, containers, phenomenal at the edge, but like all of Kubernetes, well, how much do I need? And, um, you know, you look at the hundreds of uh, additional services and, and projects that are around Kubernetes at this show, you know, how much of that will play at the edge? So it's, you know, what's the same, what's different, optimizing for it. So there's a lot of hard engineering work to, to, to adjust things. Um, and so, you know, we have multiple products to fit, you know, just from, you know, if I'm doing containers with Linux, you know, we've got solutions there. We've got Kubernetes solutions and we've got some newer solutions we've been talking about this week. Right. If you haven't heard it, just blame, for, blame me for making it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to ask Muneeb one question. You know, the, in the example you gave, you know, how much of time did the drivers spend uh, or save, you know, in this, in this example that you put together here? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I think um, just bring up your we'd slide. love to, you know, we'd love to save, you know, time for you know, all of us to work life balance, but I think we're, as I said to you, we're deploying for emergency services. So um, we would like to consider that, you know, ambulatory services we've reported, um, saving the five to 10 minutes saves lives. So the 10 ambulances in UK have already saved lives uh, because they've been able to. Um, in the police case, the worst case scenario presented to us was uh, a high speed, uh, you know, car chase where they're all trying to, you know, uh, coordinate among themselves. But then if you have AI with these units actually looking instead of, you know, following efficiently a, a bad uh, driver, you could actually, you know, AI will, you know, do the traffic management, block it, and actually give them a GPS signal to get ahead of them. So, but it's coordinating all the services. So saving lives, you know, incidents and accidents. And, you know, so I would say uh, the measure of success is really, you know, I know we get excited about, you know, congestion that we all live through, but imagine the emergency services trying to get through that congestion. So, um, you know, all the uh, places we're testing, uh, okay. has been made human impact okay. and we will talk a little bit more about this you know next year i think we're going to unveil a bigger thing at you know mobile world congress and we'll have right. our ceo pat talk about all these um uh, tech for good projects which are saving lives around the world got it okay i'm going to ask one last question and then open it to the um, to the audience to see how many questions we have but one of the things that comes up with uh, edge is the integration of IT and OT. And if I were a CEO or a CISO or you know, a lot of those folks, they're gonna say, hey, I'm connecting these two. How many people are going to be able to hack into, break into my systems now, which are crucially running my you know, utilities or manufacturing or whatever. 
I would like each of you to just bring up some of the things you know that you would, from a business perspective, talk to these you know this, these stakeholders and say, why would you do Edge when it is going to bring up uh, you know IT and OT together? Who wants to go first? Okay, uh, Stu, I'll, we'll go. I'll go. Yeah, I mean, back back <laughs> when I was an analyst, we, we used to say you know Edge you know exponentially increased your surface area for attack. Right. Uh, so that's challenging, um, and it's interesting. A lot of times we talk about like, oh, it's an Edge device or a few things. One of the things we're looking at, and especially in this community, what about at scale? So we've talked about you know, auto manufacturers and their fleet. Um, we had an announcement this week. We took um, a project that called MicroShift, and we've productized it called Red Hat Device Edge. And we have an announcement with Lockheed, who talks about their drones. And if you have a, you know, a drone that needs to fly for many hours and adjust and use the AIML technique while it's doing it, Obviously, they're concerned about you know vulnerabilities and, and what they're doing, and you know they might have thousands of these. I mean, how do I manage that fleet? So it is something that ties into the broader discussion of containers and Kubernetes and, and what we're doing. Um, and you know we've been we've been looking at solving that you know in the cloud, in the data center, and, and now at the edge. It's, it's part of the overall solution. So um, yeah, I mean the the. the, the one of the, I think IT and OT, one of the biggest things is like the old OT world, you know, you install some manufacturing device and like nobody will touch it ever again. <laughs> well, look, I mean, in the IT world, a lot of times we install stuff and we don't want to update it. In the software world, we all know the best way to be the most secure is to be on the latest version of things because you'll have all your patches and you need to do it. So we're, 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 we're getting through some of those IT, uh, OT challenges, but it, it is a big challenge and a lot of that is you know i'm a networking guy so it's the you know the layer eight and nine the people and the politics um is is where a lot of the challenges is and the technology is helping enabling it our companies are all trying to help companies you know move forward uh, and adopt those things got it thanks thanks you want to go marilyn or Muneeb? yeah marilyn go no um what was I going to say? Uh, and I love this question. I feel I answered this question. Like we were, earlier, we were just talking about as we, you know, preparing for announcements and the shows and talking to analysts, this is definitely the question we always get. And so besides the people politics of the IT, OT convergence from an actual technology perspective, like the beautiful thing about VMware is that as, as we look at what products to optimize for the edge, you know, we do have a lot of good networking and security products that can help us in particular use cases to, to teach our customers a variety of ways that they can secure um, and seg uh, segregate out the OT workloads if they need to, if that makes them feel more comfortable um, while still providing the the all the advantages of being able to virtualize to make it easy to deploy to do all those bits for the OT workloads um, but I was just gonna say I think as we um, the overall advantages that you get with being able to do the virtualization and move to the modern apps outweighs perhaps some of the concerns of how they would do it but then also the nice thing is with the having the flexibility with the edge and the different ways that you can deploy it you know you don't have to just have one edge in manufacturing you could have multiple edges of different sizes all working together and therefore where you can also then business logically separate things out if you'd like to, or if you want to add in redundancy. I know at the edge, it's for in many cases, we're saying you know we want to make it easy so you don't, um, you shouldn't have to over oversize your edge for redundancy. But in cases of critical applications, we can work on making it easy to still still be redundant but still be in a compact way. Got it. My name? Yeah, um, you know I talked about your IT OT, you know workloads and workflows. They're different. Therefore, how you secure them. Absolutely right, the tax surface goes huge. Um, there is a management plane issue about how do you distribute um, secure uh, security to them. Uh, none of these edges potentially have large firewalls or <laughs> things that you put, so you have to almost tie down the, you know, the root of trust down to the device itself. So you have to you know, secure the devices and you have to do a lot of zero trust um, frameworks because it's truly zero trust because these assets are not sitting behind firewalls and you know um, uh, things like that in the data center or cloud. Um, you get two two concerns. I think there's one the scale. I think Stu kind of pointed out to this because um, a challenge on management and pushing security policy is the scale. We're all used to, and we'll say we are all like you know, given the IT's world, if you have public clouds or data center solutions. You know, given my 10 years at VMware, I could probably count in one hand how many customers had more than 100 data centers. Not a lot. And then if you look at all our, you know, VMware partners and, you know, everybody's partner, the hyperscalers, how many regions or zones do they have on average? 150, 200 max. So the, the technology with IT has been built to scale for, you know, a few hundred locations, but hundreds of thousands of workloads. What you're dealing with here is hundreds of thousands of locations 
and very small amount of workloads. So again, that design framework needs to change on application distribution. Once you distribute the application, how is the security you know, posture you're gonna to distribute to it? And the security posture needs to be validated through a root of trust, which is almost built into the device because the device doesn't have a huge firewall in front of it. So again, how you write the application, how do you secure it, goes very quickly from an app to a hardware that's deployed in a root of trust, buried in the silicon. <laughs> unfortunately, because there's not a lot, anything, no latitude in the middle for you to apply any types of security policy, right? So um, it's an interesting, so yes, the attack surface has gone high. How do you uh, propagate a consistent security posture to tens of thousands of you know, devices? And then how do you ground it in a root of trust, which is, you know, you don't have too much to work with. Uh, becomes an interesting challenge. But again, as I said, edge native applications are the refactoring is to identify your root of trust not somewhere in the cloud because again to stew you may have a lot of times disconnected operations right so when yep. it's disconnected you can't trust uh, a, you know roots a certificate authority in the cloud it has to be you know root of trust something's on the device so it's again your design principles change right i have a question on disconnected which i leave to the end if we don't have enough questions from the audience but i would like to open it up to the audience about, you know, you have any questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, right here. Yes. <laughs> so Got it. Okay, okay yeah. so let you, me you... just answer the OT question first. It's operational technology that is embedded into shop floor devices or, or in a utility company that is doing water flow. So that's, the question was, you know, what is OT? Those are things that you know, are physical in nature, which will open valves, close valves, start a press, stop a press in a shop floor. And when we put edge solutions, we are bringing these two together. I will let Stu repeat your question and answer that question. Sure. I, I think if I summarize your question, it's okay, Kubernetes or how do I how do I choose how do I think about the architecture at the edge? And it's actually been something we've been debating at this conference for I think at least four years. So uh, there's you know K3s and K0s and micro Kates and. Uh, everything like that. So uh, Red Hat participated in, in a number of those. Uh, we created a project ca called MicroShift um, because a lot of it is, you know, thinking back to what Muneeb talked about, there's differences in architecture. If, I, if I'm thinking about, you know, deploying in a traditional enterprise data center or I'm thinking about deploying in a hyperscaler, the edge has very different needs and some of the things that we think we need by default, I, I don't need. And then there's other things that I do need that I, I didn't need in that environment. So we spent a bunch of time, we've worked in the community on that project and, and that's, we, we've recently productized that piece, but it's, you know, we have a full spectrum of, if I just wanna start with containers, because I mean, look, Kubernetes is awesome, but you know, if I just need a container, I don't need an orchestrator for that. So, you know, when do I go from just doing some, you know, handful of containers to when do I do something uh, that that's closer to uh, what we're doing in Kubernetes and when am I doing Kubernetes? So we, 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 we spent a lot of time bringing Kubernetes as small as possible um, and try to make it as operationally the same so that you could have a some very much a consistent experience uh, between the, the Kubernetes environment and some of your other Kubernetes environment. And the nice thing underneath, we have, you know, a common Linux platform, obviously. And so you know, there are other two panelists who want yeah, to answer Yeah, no, um, just to add to it, right? So there's no, and it almost reminds me, I'm a, I'll show my age now. I'm kind of a Linux kernel contributor back in the 90s. <laughs> and, you know, when we wrote the Linux kernel, it was a big impact. Then you had to do our real-time OS, right? So we had to carve out a whole heap and throw it away. But you can go out there and see there's real-time OS of different flavors. So what I'm getting at is, based on your use case, what goes into the components will vary. Back to your first question about operational technology, the workflows are not consistent in a meat factory to a defense to a, you know, um, so the workflows are very different in these because you're dealing with real life situations, which are analog signals. You're trying to convert into digital signals, right? So um, what's more important for you is to understand the modularity 
and be able to use the right set of modules to uh, get the outcome at the edge. So I think all of us are focused on that modularity of what that real-time OS, and it needs to be real-time too, by the way, right? You're, if you're in a traffic signal and you don't cut off the, the green to red in that fraction of time, then there's gonna be accidents, right? So uh, the real-time aspect is super critical. So what you pick and choose as the ingredients of that will be based on what type of outcome and workflow you're gonna solve for. I was going to comment with, with um, Stu, what you said, the the fact that, I mean, the beauty of Kubernetes is that you can mix and match all the different packages for the different areas, and that that is the massive advantage of having Kubernetes. So that's something that we, we don't want to be as we build for the edge too prescriptive, but we do have to start somewhere, because then if you think of, uh, it's something that keeps me up at night worrying. In fact, I was talking about it earlier this week, where, like, how, how do we pick? How do we decide? Um, with the beauty of it, everything that we're doing at VMware for our edge optimizations across the different packages, we're, of course, contributing back. We're listening to our customers to see what's going to be, you know, the most useful, and I think we're kind of just basing our decisions, and, and tr but allowing to be as flexible as possible, uh, and then the customer can make those design choices based on the use cases, because maybe they'll use a lot of stuff that's edge optimized, and maybe one package that won't be, and we'll just have to account for the extra space or computer or the different needs. Okay, so I do see a big sign saying stop over there, so unfortunately, you can ask the panelists after the end of the session, if you don't mind, but one last thing I just wanted to say, when you talked about disconnected environments, I suggest all of you look at private 5G and see how that can help edge on, the, you know, on, on a disconnected environment. With that, please give a hand to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you for having me.